day two we're feeling a little knackered so this is going to be a lateral version <laughs> of one of Mick's master classes <laughs> um, I've always been interested we're looking at a priory here you think of abbeys in the countryside and I have a sense that some of these huge estates that went with these places were one of the kind of defining factors in the in the English landscape because mm. they were often huge owners of land yeah, that's right. lots of money and they developed estates yeah. and yeah discussed. I mean there's the, there's there's three great changes of ownership in the country isn't there there's the the changeover at the Norman conquest when all the land was redistributed amongst the Normans there's the dissolution of the monasteries when vast areas went from ecclesiastical ownership into secular ownership, the new Tudor yuppies basically, and then there's the early 20th century breaking up the big country estates, knocking the big country houses down, redistributing the land. Then that's the three great changes in the last thousand years. And I think one of the things few few people realise is just how much land the church yeah. owned. Yeah, probably 25% of the country, although that includes bishops' land as well. And of course, there's there's a large percentage of the population in the monasteries or in some way working for them, connected with them or whatever, as stewards and servants and so on. And how did they acquire the land? How did the church get land? What was the...? Well, the normal arrangement is that some sort of aristocratic family grants a piece of land to a particular group of monks or a particular monastic order to establish a new monastery on the site. And you might say, well, why would they do that? Why would they give that land out of the family into somebody else's ownership? And, and of course, what was expected to be a perpetual ownership? They didn't know the dissolution was coming in three, four, five hundred years' time. They were, in effect, giving that land forever. It was going out of the family. What were they going to get out of it? And, of course, the answer is they were hoping to save their souls in hell by having this group of monks or canons or friars or whatever they were saying perpetual prayers, masses and so on uh, for them while it's they like were alive. It's like an insurance policy. It's like an insurance policy. So while they're alive and then while they're dead because the monastic belief was that you went to purgatory where you were judged and you decided whether you went to hell or heaven. So if you had people saying masses and praying for you, you would hope to keep out of purgatory and certainly keep out of hell. And then, so very often, the land is left for the ancestors and their predecessors. And I've got a memory of a discussion, I think I had it with you, uh, about the fact that often people gave poor areas of land, but suddenly um, yeah. Yeah. The, the monks, the church, discovered sheep. The sheep could utilise the poorer land, and suddenly yeah. the churches became rich from wool. Is that, that some that, sort of cockeyed? That's quite a, a, a wobbly version of it, but oh, there's, fine. There's, there's, there's certainly an element of truth in it. I mean, it's a mistake, I think, to think that these um, monks, nuns, whatever, were after rubbish land. They would be very pleased if people gave mm. them a good quality estate. But certainly with people like the Cistercians, who come in, in the 12th century, the pre Monstratensians, because part of their ethic was physical work, that you went out and dug ditches and you fell trees and you cleared marsh, if they were given land that was pretty inferior, their lay brothers in particular, which is another aspect, would set about taming it. And that was free labour. And it was free labour, and you know, in some cases there were, you can only describe them as armies of lay brothers who couldn't read or write, but had physical strength and a lot of um, skills like drainage and, and tree felling and all the rest. And the church, on the basis of this essentially free land, free labour mm. and wool and various other things, began to get quite rich. Immensely rich. And, and Revo, Revo. Revo fountains. I mean, the, I mean, the richest were the Benedictine houses. The places like, um, well, Westminster, Abingdon, Bury St Edmunds. All the big fam Canterbury. All the big famous early monasteries were the wealthiest. Um, the and what happened to this money? They were making all this money from well, <laughs> cheap labour, free land. Where did? Yeah. Well, this is the point. You see, you, here you've got a lot of celibate men principally, but also, uh, you know, women in monasteries who weren't going to breed another generation. So what do you do with the money? You can't pass it on from generation to generation. So what you do is build. 
right. basically. Right. You know, you, you replace your barns, you replace your mills, you <laughs> pull the church down and rebuild it several times. So most of their money, I mean a certain amount goes in charity, looking after the poor, giving food away, things like that, but huge amounts of it go into this you know, building campaign. The Middle Ages must have been like a continuous building site for hundreds of years. With the know. Masons being very important. With the Masons being very important people. But even so, you see, by the time, just before the dissolution, Thomas Cromwell, working on behalf of Henry VIII, carries out this thing called the Valor Ecclesiasticus in 1535, which is the value of the church. Henry VIII wanted to know how much the church was worth. And by the church, we don't mean one little building, we mean the capital C. How much was the church worth? And was it like a hugely shocking figure? Is it well, an amazing figure? It was. Figure? I mean, I don't know if anybody's ever added it up, but this place was worth 156 quid right. in 1535. Now, given that uh, the annual daily rate for a farm labourer might have been a penny or tuppence, you can see what you're up against, you know. <laughs> and the wealthiest abbeys, like Glastonbury and Westminster, were worth knocking on for a thousand quid a year, which is, uh, you know, today's billions, really. And one of the things we, we usually do in these circumstances is I ask you to kind of describe what this place would have looked like to Victor, so Victor can do a drawing. We've got to do that, haven't we? What, what do you think of when you see the inside of this place? Uh, stained Gordy. glass windows? Gaudy. Beautiful building, tall building? Or? It, it, well, probably tall, but, but, but probably highly coloured. Right. I mean, you mentioned the window glass, which they would have had. We've right had the some, yeah. and we've had bits of it. Yeah. But they did paint these places up, you know, with, with, with gaudy colours. Yeah. So that what would look very tasteless to us. Yeah. And bear in mind what these people's lives were like. The, the, the mass of people who lived down here, they might have visited it. The brightest thing they saw in their life were flowers. You know, everything else was dull browns, greys, greens, whatever. Somebody talked so, about going into one of these things almost for the average peasant in yeah. living a rather, yeah. at like a, almost a psychedelic experience, Absolutely. the colours of it, Absolutely. and the music and the and smoke. You have the music and the incense and all the rest of it. And you mentioned this morning when we were talking about it, I said, you know, it's a huge building, and you said only 12 people, and yeah. there's, there's a reason for those 12. Yes, it's emulating Christ and the disciples, so right. that your normal complement is an abbot and a prior, uh, or an abbess, whatever, and, and 12 inmates, if I can call it that. And would there have been music in a place like this? Uh, Probably, I mean, it plain must have... Plain song or whatever. Uh, well, yes, we say they've had to sing the services, and I mean, that's the part of the business of the 12, because you get less than that, and some of these places were down to two or three by the time of the dissolution. It must have been very difficult to conduct the daily round of services and the singing and you know the antiphons and all that stuff. It must have been very difficult uh, with, with a small number. And a dozen is about the minimum, really, you can get away with. I mean, some of them have multiples of that, you know. And, and in the bigger monasteries, in the 12th century in particular, I mean, I think Revo was claimed to have 600 monks in the 12th century on, under... Um, uh, 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 what the hell is his name? Aylred, right. right, the great 12th century abbot Aylred. But a lot of those are probably lay brothers, you see. And this situation mm. here, these priors, priories, these abbeys, was repeated all over the country. Yeah. Land owning, yeah. Yeah. earning money from free land, really, yeah. and hundreds of them yeah. all over the About place. About 800 altogether. Yeah. yeah. And hugely important because you, this was the places that saved your I'll soul. I'll finish with it now. Yeah, you know, you needed this place for these guys to eventually get to heaven, yeah. really. They were yeah. your key. And the, the East Anglia and Essex are a very good example of this because there are large numbers <laughs> of small priories mm. so that almost every landowning family, by certainly by 1200, had got one of these little priories on its land where they were being buried and where the monk's job or the canons or whatever job was to just keep the services going, keep the prayers going. Yeah. And, and, and I think it's Crouch who says that there was, there was really no land left. There was no, nothing else to give. They'd given everything that they could possibly get rid of to get their own little priory. And every family had a little tin pot priory by, well, certainly by 1350. I think we're going to have to call it a day there because we've got a film scene behind us. Thank you very much. OK, we'll do some more. Uh, we'll get in touch with Victor. And, you haven't uh, asked me about barns. Oh, I could ask him about barns. On another occasion. <laughs>